Hi, I'm Ladar Gavay-Lazi. And I'm Alex Trayman. And welcome to Jerusalem Minute, where we discuss the week's hottest topics out of Israel. Alex, so how are you doing this week? Doing well, thank you. So we have a lot to discuss. Our first topic, the Gaza War. We are on week nine of the Gaza War. The IDF has expanded operations to the south, intense fighting. IDF spokesperson saying the operation has now entered phase three. Let's take a look. We have entered a new phase in our war against Hamas. Hamas broke the humanitarian pause when it violated the hostage release agreement by refusing to release women, children, and babies, as agreed. Hamas also fired rockets at Israeli homes. We pursued them in northern Gaza. We're now pursuing Hamas in southern Gaza too. We're pursuing Hamas wherever Hamas is hiding, in the north and in the south. All right, well, Alex, the IDF now says it's entering phase three. So what is the strategy? Well, the first part of the strategy, of course, is to take out the tunnel infrastructure. There's over 500 miles worth of tunnels underneath the Gaza Strip. There's reports that the IDF is now flooding tunnels using pumps uh, with seawater from the Mediterranean in order to actually flood these tunnels and to destroy them. And what about in the north? I mean, have they completed their mission in the north? Much of the fighting in the north has been finished, but it's not complete. Uh, and in certain of the refugee camps like Jabalia and others, the IDF is still involved in intensive fighting there, uh, blowing up uh, entrances to tunnels, uh, confiscating rockets, and targeting uh, senior Hamas leadership. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're seeing very intense fighting. So what are some of the challenges uh, the IDF soldiers that are facing now? Well, as the fighting moves to the south and you have a much higher concentration of Gazan residents uh, will move from the north into the south, uh, there is a much greater pressure on the IDF uh, to try to avoid civilian casualties and to have pinpoint uh, operations uh, that don't have as much collateral damage. And so you're actually seeing video footage of the IDF uh, going into buildings where they know terrorists are, are uh, stationed and getting into these uh, intensive gunfights uh, together with terrorists. And we've actually seen the number of IDF soldiers uh, going down, casualties in the fight going up. Uh, and there are also reports that some of these firefights are uh, involved in trying to re recover hostages who might be hidden in some of these buildings. Okay, so a lot of questions from that. I mean, look, we're hearing that really the fighting has intensified and soldiers unfortunately are falling where we're, the IDF is releasing new names every day. I mean, how much longer do you think this can go on? How much longer will the Israeli public take such, such losses? Well, from a military perspective, the amount of losses that uh, Israel has uh, suffered is very low. Uh, there's as close to 100 uh, casualties, soldiers that have uh, been killed in nine weeks of fighting compared to thousands and thousands of Hamas operatives inside the Strip. So really a, a military success. But as you mentioned, uh, the soldiers are of great value to Israel. These are really civilians, many of them. These are, these are fathers, these are sons, these are daughters, brothers, sisters, friends, and colleagues. And so each casualty uh, is a great, great loss. Uh, to the state of Israel. But at the same time, I think that the Israeli public does see that significant gains are being made in the Gaza Strip and that the war is going well. Absolutely. And, you know, we're seeing, uh, we're hearing a lot of reports and we're seeing also a lot of videos coming out of Hamas fighters who are surrendering. There's growing discontent within the organization, reports that Gazan civilians are openly speaking out against Hamas. Now, how close is the IDF to bringing down Hamas? Well, they're getting closer and closer every day. Uh, there's definitely been a change of strategy. Uh, rather than just killing every Hamas operative, they're now actually going for the surrender of these operatives. And we've seen truckloads of uh, Hamas members stripped down to their underwear, you know, with their hands tied behind their backs, 
um, put on on trucks and actually trucked back even into Israel. It's it's very embarrassing uh, to uh, Hamas in, inside Gaza, and it's giving the signal that uh, the IDF is squarely in charge of the Gaza Strip. And it's still believed, though, that many of Hamas senior leadership are alive, including Yahya Sinwar. Uh, they they encircled his house uh, last week, and the belief is that if they take out these senior leaders of Hamas, including Sinwar, that could lead to the faster surrender of Hamas and the end of the war. So Sinwar, they've they've circled his house, but at the same time, you know, there's reports that when the IDF went north, he fled in the underground tunnels to the south, and now the IDF is going south. He's fled back north. So what's going on there? There were reports that Sinwar actually. Uh, traveled as part in the humanitarian convoy that was left open and protected by the IDF. In fact, hostages also were taken, reported that they were dressed up in hijab and just taken along these humanitarian corridors. So you see how some of the humanitarian efforts that the United States and the international community have demanded uh, have led to some significant disadvantages on the battlefield. It's going to be a difficult battle. Uh, to try to find uh, the heads of Hamas. Uh, this is probably what will signify the end of the war when they do that. Mm -hmm. And yet, in the meantime, uh, and despite, you know, all the intensifying that's going on in, in Gaza and the victory after victory of the IDF, Hamas is still able to fire missiles into Israel on a nearly daily basis. Well, before the war started, Hamas was believed or assessed to have had as many as 40,000 rockets. They fired 11, 12,000 rockets so far, which means that many more are still left. It's also believed that the, they are manufacturing these rockets inside the tunnels themselves. And when they do that, then they're able to distribute, distribute them throughout the Gaza Strip. I recently saw a map of where rockets had been fired uh, from within Gaza. It's over across the entire Gaza Strip. And uh, they've even been firing rockets now from the safe zones uh, that the IDF is protecting inside uh, the southern sections of the Gaza Strip. So they're being made in real time. They're being fired from, from anywhere. Uh, and it's going to take a significant uh, effort for the IDF to remove the capabilities to fire the rockets. However, the Iron Dome is shooting out uh, these rockets from the sky with approximately 90 to 95% uh, accuracy rate. I mean, that's really just incredible, though, that Hamas is still using its civilian population in Gaza as human shields, firing rockets from safe zones that, the, that Israel and the international community have designated as safe zones. So, I mean, essentially, Israel can't even go into those zones because they're safe zones. And Hamas is, of course, taking advantage of that. We've also seen video this week of Hamas, uh, of, of Gazans essentially raiding UNRWA uh, depots where humanitarian aid is stored and not being distributed supposedly being held and reserved for Hamas. What can you tell us about that? Well, these are some of the, the most bitter videos coming out of Gaza. It, Israel's been uh, pressured to allow hundreds of uh, convoys of humanitarian humanitarian aid into the strip, truckload after truckload, uh, many of them going directly to UNRWA. And we're seeing these videos of, of people just ravaging uh, these supplies, which are not being distributed. And, and so the question is, what is this humanitarian aid for? But this this is the strategy of Hamas, which is to to take the money, to take the cement, to take the aid that's supposed to go to the civilians of Gaza for the last 18 years and to use it. So there's no there's no reason why they would change their strategy now and to be firing rockets and to be building tunnels that come up in schools, in mosques, in hospitals, in safe zones. Uh, this is the strategy of Hamas. They want the IDF to kill as many civilians as possible. This is their strategy because the more civilians that die in the Gaza Strip, the more pressure on Israel to stop the fighting. All right, Alex, thank you for your analysis. And now an interview with Ophir Falk, the foreign policy advisor to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Alex, you had the chance to sit with him earlier. Let's hear what he had to say. Hi, Ophir. Welcome to the program. You know, we, we've seen that the Houthis have been attacking uh, at uh, ships, have been sending uh, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles into Israel. Um, the United States apparently has asked Israel to stay out of it. Um, Israel is probably looking for the United States to do more. Can you tell me a little bit more about the considerations? Hi, Alex. Thanks for having me. Um, we obviously do not want a second or third front, but we are fully prepared for, uh, for anything that comes our way. Um, the IDF is very, uh, is very, very on the ball right now. Uh, we can see whatever the Houthi are doing and, uh, we'll, we'll take care of it. 
we've seen uh, a change in strategy inside Gaza, uh, whereas previously uh, the IDF was killing as many Hamas operatives as possible. Now we've seen uh, truckloads of uh, militants being uh, rounded up, stripped down to their underwear with their hands tied behind their backs. Uh, is this a change in strategy and what's the purpose? The IDF strategy and the uh, directive that was uh, that was given by Netanyahu's war cabinet is to destroy Hamas and to free our hostages. Nothing has changed. The IDF is fully focused and the war cabinet is fully focused on destroying Hamas and freeing our hostages. Those two goals are not mutually exclusive. To the contrary, they are they actually complement one another. The stronger uh, I, the IDF hits Hamas, the, 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 the better the probability or the higher the probability of uh, freeing our hostages. Is rounding up of these uh, Hamas uh, operatives, is that part of the strategy of uh, potentially trying to arrange a, a uh, hostage exchange? Well, the IDF, as you know, clearly works in uh, complete compliance with international law. And uh, any Hamas operative terrorist that surrenders and puts up his hands, uh, we'll take him in. We act in, in complete compliance with international law. And actually, we urge uh, these, uh, these people to uh, surrender because uh, we are going to destroy Hamas. And if they want to save their lives, they should uh, raise their hands. It seems like there's uh, a, a difference of opinion on how long the war could or should take. Uh, reports were that uh, in a recent meeting with the War Cabinet, Anthony Blinken told Israel that he may not have enough credit uh, to extend the fighting for as long as the IDF thinks it's, it might be needed. It's been reported that it could be uh, as many as eight weeks in Gaza. Is Are you in lockstep with the U.S. administration on the, on the length of the war? We've received uh, a lot of support, great support from the United States, bipartisan support, and uh, great support from the President of the United States from day one. Uh, he's in uh, almost daily contact with our Prime Minister, with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, we have a common goal and a common interest of destroying Hamas. That's clear. And uh, we'll do, and the IDF will do whatever it takes to destroy Hamas. Um, that's also clear. And we, we feel absolutely uh, no pressure. Uh, we're going to destroy Hamas. Hamas is probably the smaller of Iranian terror proxies on Israel's border. Hezbollah has fired at least a thousand times, uh, including mortars, uh, drones, anti-tank precision guided missiles at Israeli positions, both civilian and military. Uh, the IDF seems to have stepped up its retaliations. Uh, what's the likelihood that as the fighting in the south in Gaza begins to wind down that we could see the ramping up of hostilities inside southern Lebanon? Well, the prime minister made it very clear that uh, although we are not interested in a second front, we're fully prepared for a second front. Uh, dozens of Hezbollah terrorists have been taken out by the IDF. The Hezbollah has been hit hard uh, since the outset, uh, since they have uh, uh, fired at, at, at our positions. And uh, although we don't want a second front, we're fully prepared. Uh, Nisrala uh, would be wise not to open a, a second front. If he does do that unfortunate uh, thing, then uh, Lebanon ver may very well look like Gaza. Uh, it's been reported that uh, Netanyahu hurriedly left a war cabinet meeting to take a phone call from Russian President Vladimir Putin. Can you tell me anything about that call? Well, actually, I can't tell you anything about that call, uh, but I can tell you it's not the first call. It's not the first time that uh, the prime minister has... Uh, clarified that we are going to destroy Hamas. And that's the, uh, that's the war cabinet directive. Uh, we seek to minimize, uh, as you know, we seek to minimize civilian casualties. That's our strategy. That's Israel's strategy. It always has been, not only because it's the right thing to do, because it's, all, it, because it's, the, the, it's the effective thing to do. On the other hand, Hamas, as you know, Alex, uh, their strategy is uh, to, uh, they seek to maximize civilian casualties, uh, both Israeli civilians and Palestinian civilians. They hide behind their civilians. They hide below their civilians. Uh, why do they seek to maximize? What? One is because they're a sick, genocidal terrorist organization. But perhaps more importantly, because they think it's effective. They think if it's, it's an effective um, propaganda tool to coerce Israel into a ceasefire. That's not going to happen. We're going to destroy Hamas. The IDF is destroying Hamas right now as we speak. Uh, and this is the beginning of the end of Hamas. 
Ophir, you probably spend more time than anybody with uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, he's probably under more pressure than any man in the world right now. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about his, uh, his spirit, how he's doing and how he's operating at this time? Without getting into too much details, uh, Prime Minister is very strong and very focused, and he's directing this war. His, his war cabinet is directing this thing from the outset. Uh, he actually, uh, as you know, Alex, he, th- he thrives under, uh, under pressure and in crisis, and this crisis has been led by uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and he, he will lead us to uh, victory. Well, for Falk, uh, Foreign Policy Advisor to the Prime Minister, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. While the IDF is continuing in its mission, world pressure is mounting. Over the weekend, the U.N. Security Council voted on a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire. The U.S., of course, vetoed the resolution. Let's take a look now at a clip from Israeli ambassador to the U.N., Gilad Eldan. Hamas has a clear script. If you call for a ceasefire, then you are following it. But Hamas's vicious strategy is also to advance the death of many Gazan civilians as well. This is why Hamas hides behind and under the civilian population. This is why they use hospitals for cover and schools as arms catches, including UNRWA schools. Hamas knows that the more civilian fatalities there are, the more pressure the international community will put on Israel. Do we want to be the actors in the show that Hamas has carefully crafted? Why is Hamas not held fully responsible by the UN and its bodies? Tell Gazan the truth. They have to hear it from you. This is the only way to bring about bottom-up change in Gaza. All right, Alex, so sitting here in Jerusalem, you know, the idea of a ceasefire really does seem ridiculous when Israel knows who its enemy is, Hamas. The ceasefire would only serve to benefit Hamas. So how is the world simply not getting it? Well, the United Nations has been one of the world's most anti-Semitic bodies uh, since the 1975 Zionism equals racism resolution that was brought up uh, in those halls. So it's not surprising that uh, the UN, which has more resolutions against the state of Israel than any other country, and actually more than all other countries combined, uh, it's not a surprise that they would cease to call for, they would call for a ceasefire now between Israel and Hamas. That's exactly what Hamas wants, and the UN has always been uh, happy to pressure Israel. Now, the U.S. really coming to Israel's side here at the U.N., wouldn't you say? If it wasn't for the United States, I mean, this resolution would have passed. There would be tremendous pressure. It's a good thing for Israel uh, that while there has been some pressure uh, from the U.S. uh, administration, uh, that they are supporting Israel at the United Nations. So you talked a little bit about uh, the pressure uh, from the Biden administration. I mean, clearly Biden has himself has made very uh, strong remarks in support of Israel, in support of Israel's right uh, uh, to fight uh, this war, which, of course, was was thrust upon it. Uh, but, you know, I want to address uh, a report now from Politico that reported over the weekend that the administration has asked Israel to wrap up the war by January. So what's your take on this? Well, there's certainly a bit of a disagreement here about how long the war will last. Uh, Israel saying that it needs another three to four weeks at least uh, to finish up the operations in the south, in, in the city of Khan Yunis, which is where most of the Hamas leadership and many of the hostages are believed to be housed right now. Uh, and then an additional three to four weeks to wrap up the fighting, a total of two months. Uh, you know, over last week, Antony Blinken was in Israel for the fifth time, and he was part of a war cabinet meeting. Uh, Defense Minister Gallant said that, uh, you know, Israeli public is giving the IDF support for many months uh, to continue the fighting. Anthony Blinken said, I don't think that you have enough credit for that. Uh, So definitely a lot of pressure. But uh, the U.S., even though they're putting pressure, the the spokespersons from uh, the White House uh, have said that there is no timetable uh, on the fighting as long as the IDF is going out of its way uh, to reduce the number of civilian casualties. And, you know, we keep circling back to the humanitarian issue because, of course, it's it's a very grave situation in Gaza and uh, the casualties are mounting, although, of course, the numbers uh, cannot be trusted since they're coming uh, directly from Hamas. Uh, but, you know, the UN is issuing statement after statement about just how horrible the humanitarian situation in Gaza is. And yet, as we discussed earlier, we have video coming out showing warehouses full of humanitarian aid 
which is being saved for Hamas. We see truckloads of humanitarian aid that Hamas fighters with, you know, machine guns are carrying off, shooting at uh, Gazan civilians. So, you know, what's really going on here? I mean, the situation inside the Gaza Strip is, is awful. I mean, there's no there's no way to sugarcoat it. As much trucks as are going into the to the Gaza Strip right now, um, it's not enough, and it's not enough to to make a humanitarian situation go away. And a humanitarian crisis is not going to go away until the war is over. This is a situation that Hamas brought upon its people, and of course, Hamas is taking whatever small amounts of humanitarian aid are coming in and using it for themselves. This has been their strategy all along. Absolutely. And the international community is simply turning a blind eye to this, it seems. Well, you know, we're also starting to see reports that Egypt may be willing uh, to accept uh, some Gazan refugees, provided that they don't remain in Egypt for the long term. So really, if the international community does hope to alleviate the, the situation for Gazans and with so many thousands of buildings destroyed, we keep seeing video after video of the destruction that the IDF is causing the Gaza Strip, they're going to have to find some some solution uh, for the Gazan residents, and it's probably not going to be inside Gaza. And now, you know, as the war continues, international pressure will only uh, get worse on Israel. So, you know, it's really an impossible war, a war that Israel did not want, but it's being forced to fight. How do you think this will ultimately play out in the diplomatic arena? Well, it also depends if the war is limited only to uh, the southern arena with the Gaza Strip, but we keep seeing that uh, fighting continues to escalate uh, on the northern border in particular and elsewhere. And it's quite possible that at some point the IDF is going to have to enter into southern Lebanon and do what they're doing in Lebanon as to what they're doing in Gaza. So we're going to have to see what type of pressure there is. On the one hand, uh, that would step up pressure on Israel. On the other hand, that would change the dynamic of the war uh, from one between Israel and Palestinians, and particularly Hamas and Gaza, to one against Iran and all of its proxies, which includes Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis in Yemen. Absolutely. And that leads us directly into our third topic today, which is let's not forget that Israel is fighting on two other fronts, essentially. I mean, not as it's fighting in Gaza, but uh, in the north, Hezbollah, which is continuing to fire missiles into Israel every day, and the Houthis from the south, which have now announced they will target any Israeli ship entering the Red Sea. So as you mentioned, Alex, you know, we have a lot of action going on on the other fronts, not a full-blown escalation, not a full-blown war. Let's start with the Houthis. Um, at first, it was almost a nuisance, a laughable nuisance. Uh, now it's starting to become much more than that. Well, the Houthis, as you mentioned, not only have hijacked uh, ships that had ties to Israeli owners, but now have threatened to uh, interrupt any maritime trade uh, in the Red Sea. They've also attacked at the USS John Carney and other US ships that are stationed in the Red Sea and in, in the in in the surrounding area. Um, and it's really up to the international community to uh, maintain uh, international shipping lanes. Uh, Israel has been uh, pressured by the United States not to take action against the Houthis, uh, even though we did see the first uh, bombing of a, of a site in Sana, which was a missile a manufacturing facility uh, more than a week ago. Um, but Israel has warned the United States that if it fails to tackle the threat from the Houthis, that they will be willing to do so themselves. So we could see uh, some escalations in the coming days and weeks. Absolutely. And let's talk now about Hezbollah and what's happening on the northern front. Missiles coming in on also on a nearly daily basis from the north. Israel is counterattacking specific terror sites, uh, relating to Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. What can you tell us about the Northern Front? Well, as you mentioned, you know, way more than 1,000 uh, mortars and anti-tank guided missiles fired at uh, Israeli positions, both civilian and military, uh, in recent weeks. The IDF has been responding on a tit-for-tat basis, uh, being warned not to expand uh, the war into southern Lebanon. Israel has stepped up its retaliations, making them a little bit more serious, targeting a little bit further north of the, the border with Lebanon, uh, hitting the Hezbollah command centers. Hamas is also has, has uh, infrastructure inside southern Lebanon. And the growing sense uh, inside Israel is that uh, when the war starts to wind down uh, with Hamas and the Gaza Strip, that the war is going to intensify in a big way in southern Lebanon to tackle Hezbollah. 
Well, absolutely, because, you know, we've seen what happens when you have a terrorist organization sitting on your border. We saw what happened on October 7th. Hezbollah is no different. They share the exact same ideology as Hamas. So how can Israel justify keeping Hezbollah in power and eliminating Hamas when Hezbollah is by far much worse uh, than Hamas? Exactly. The difference between Hamas and Hezbollah is that Hezbollah is a much stronger force than Hamas ever was, and that's because of the land bridge uh, between Iran that goes through Iraq and Syria into southern Lebanon. There's over 150,000 rockets, many of them long-range, precision-guided, uh, in southern Lebanon, pointed at Israel. They could blanket the entire homeland of the state of Israel uh, if they start firing in rapid fire, doing much more damage than the Qassam rockets that Hamas has in the Gaza Strip. And there's also the fears of an October 7th-style invasion uh, by Hezbollah operatives from southern Lebanon into Israel. And you have uh, communities, Jewish communities, that are literally right up against the Lebanese border, and it will simply not be safe for them to return to their homes until Hezbollah is taken out as a force. And yet, you know, there are reports of an attempted uh, diplomatic solution, so sort of to push Hezbollah back past uh, the Litani. We've seen uh, with Hamas, diplomacy with terror organizations, it doesn't work. And yet there is this sort of international push to reach some sort of diplomatic solution. Why should Israel agree to that? Well, after the 2006 war uh, between Israel and Hezbollah and southern Lebanon, a ceasefire was declared. Uh, and the international organization UNIFIL, part of the United Nations, was brought into southern Lebanon in order to make sure that southern Lebanon would not become a militarized center. What happens? Uh, Israel's not permitted to enter the territory, uh, and Hezbollah rapidly escalates the amount of uh, military capacity that they have inside southern Lebanon. So I don't think that Israel is going to be willing to uh, negotiate some kind of a settlement with Hezbollah at this point. Uh, and they recognize that in order to change the game and to provide safety and security for the residents of Israel, that they have to not only take out and destroy Hamas and Gaza, but they're going to have to completely take out and destroy uh, Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, and it's going to be a mighty task to do so, but that's the only way that they can change the the game in the Middle East. And you think that that's the consensus in Israel today, that they really are heading towards uh, a confrontation with Hezbollah? And, and if so, what would a confrontation with Hezbollah look like in compared to Hamas? I think it would be a much more difficult uh, task. Well, it would be different in the sense that uh, Israel wouldn't be have the uh, have the luxury of going with the same kind of precision operations, the methodical operations uh, inside southern Lebanon that they've had in Gaza. They would have to move much faster because the amount of rockets could do so much more damage uh, coming from the north than they do from coming from Gaza. So they would have to move fast and furious uh, inside southern Lebanon and to really make certain that Hezbollah surrenders as quickly as possible. Absolutely. And not a, a very optimistic uh, outlook there, unfortunately. I mean, I think we're, we're in the beginning stages of the war. I know it's been nine weeks already and the international community wants Israel to wind the war down. But they're saying there's probably two months of fighting left in Gaza and there is a consensus that this war is likely to expand. And I also want to talk a little bit about the attacks that we're seeing uh, on U.S. bases in Iraq and in Syria. You know, it's all, of course, backed by Iran. The U.S. so far not offering much of a response. I mean, do you foresee it intervening in a more meaningful way? Well, there's been over 100 attacks uh, by Iranian terror proxies inside Iraq, uh, inside Syria, uh, at U.S. installations and infrastructure there, uh, as well as uh, these attacks on the international shipping uh, that we're seeing the the Iran's other proxies, the Houthis, committing. Uh, so the question is, will the United States finally react? What What's their red line here? I think that uh, they're being tested. The United States is being tested. And of course, the United States, from the very beginning of the war, has moved a very significant portion of its military to USS carrier groups, the Eisenhower and the Ford carrier groups that have enough uh, more air power on them than most militaries have in their entire fleets. Uh, and at a certain point, if Iran continues to poke the United States in the eye and demonstrate time and again that the U.S. foreign policy of trying to appease Iran has been an absolute failure, 
I do think that there are people within the defense establishment that would like to see some of the hardware that's moved into this region actually put into use. Uh, and so we're going to have to see what that red line is and what the United States will do uh, should that red line be crossed. And let's not forget, of course, we're uh, in heading towards the elections in the U.S., so it might not be uh, so simple for the U.S. or for any uh, leader to, to sort of make well, that call. That's like a double-sided coin because on the one hand, uh, certainly nobody wants to launch a war, but look around the world. You know, Russia and Ukraine war is, is continuing to, to expand. Uh, we we're seeing uh, Venezuela taking a territory in South America, and the the Middle East is uh, is on the brink of taking the globe to World War III. Uh, and at a certain point, the uh, voters in the United States are going to look at the current administration and say that the world is spiraling out of control. And the question will be, will the Biden administration say that they have to restore some degree of control and demonstrate who is the policeman of the world? Uh, and, and taking out Iran. Uh, the head of this terror octopus would be a good way of asserting, finally, uh, some U.S. control uh, in the Middle East uh, and saying that the, this type of uh, this type of belligerent activity uh, is not acceptable. All right, Alex, thank you for your analysis on that topic. And now moving on to my Jerusalem Minute. So over 137 hostages are still being held in Gaza. It's been over two months None have had any access to the outside world. None have even been visited by the International Red Cross. The International Red Cross, its motto is neutral, impartial, independent, ensuring humanitarian protection and assistance for victims of armed conflict and other situations of violence. Well, where have they been this entire time? The International Red Cross have proven to be nothing more than a taxi service shuttling hostages across the border. It has done nothing to help them while they're in captivity. In fact, just this weekend, a report came out by Khan 11 that in a meeting with one of the families of the hostages whose daughter requires daily medication, the parents thought that the Red Cross was finally willing to transfer this life-saving medication to their daughter. Instead, they were absolutely shocked to be reprimanded by the Red Cross and told to look at the Palestinian side. Well, what Palestinian side are they talking about? Palestinian side of Hamas, which is holding their daughter captive, so much for being neutral, so much for offering humanitarian protection and assistance. And by the way, this is the second hostage uh, to require medication that the Red Cross has refused to provide. Uh, the second hostage who was released in the hostage exchange deal is an 84-year-old woman who is now in the hospital fighting for her life. So the International Red Cross has proved once again that its motto may be neutral, impartial, and independent, but not when it comes to Israel. And Alex, I know that your My Jerusalem Minute has to do with our next topic, so let's jump into that introduction first, and then we'll hear from you. So anti-Semitism has skyrocketed since October 7th and since uh, the Hamas war with Israel. Uh, it skyrocketed around the world, but especially on college campuses. This past week, U.S. Congress took matters into their own hands and summoned the presidents of MIT, Penn, and Harvard for a hearing on campus anti-Semitism. Let's take a quick look at a section of the hearing. At Penn, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct? Yes or no? If the speech turns into conduct, it can be harassment. Yes. I, I am asking specifically calling for the genocide of Jews. Does that constitute bullying or harassment? If it is directed and severe or pervasive, it is harassment. So the answer is yes. It is a context-dependent decision, Congresswoman. It's a context-dependent decision. That's your testimony today. Calling for the genocide of Jews is depending upon the context. That is not bullying or harassment. This is the easiest question to answer yes, Ms. McGill. So is your if testimony it, that it, you will not answer yes? If it uh, is, if the, yes speech or becomes, no. if the speech becomes conduct, it can be harassment. Yes. Conduct meaning committing the act of genocide? The 
the speech is not harassment, this is unacceptable, Ms. McGill. I'm going to give you one more opportunity for the world to see your answer. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's code of conduct when it comes to bullying and harassment? Yes or no? It can be harassment. The answer is yes. Quite a clip. More than the clip of the of the hearing itself was to see some of these university presidents trying to walk back their comments during the testimony, uh, saying that uh, this kind of uh, bullying is the harassment, uh, you know, and saying that uh, it depends on the context. So, Alex, why don't you give us your Jerusalem Minute? Because I know you have a lot to say on this topic. Well, absolutely. Uh, the anti-Semitism on university campuses is not a new phenomenon that sprung up only uh, in the aftermath of Israel's war against Hamas. Really, for 30 years, we've started to see uh, intimidation against uh, students on the campuses, uh, students that would write papers uh, in support of Israel or Israel's history would receive failing grades uh, for writing those types of papers, and it was about 25 years ago that we started to see the phenomenon of the Israel Apartheid Week on the university campuses. Um, and the Jewish community at that time really did very little uh, to try to uh, clamp down on the Israel Apartheid Week, choosing not to uh, tackle that phenomenon head on, but rather uh, only to uh, you know counter the intimidation and the bullying of the Israel Apartheid Week with positive programming that was not directly confrontational. Uh, and, and really the donors, uh, the Jewish donors that have now removed or threatened to remove some of their funding from these universities, like we saw uh, Mark Rowan, who is the CEO of Apollo uh, Capital Management, uh, calling for donors to remove their funds. He himself, uh, an alumni of the University of, of Pennsylvania, and also uh, Stephen Ross, Ross Stevens, rather, who is the founder and CEO of Stone Ridge Asset Management, who's pulled $100 million. You know, this is a day late and a dollar short. Uh, you know, Jewish donors have donated so much money uh, to the university campuses uh, for decades, but they failed to ensure that the campuses remained a safe space for students. And we've only seen the amount of anti-Semitism and harassment on Jewish students grow. We've seen swastikas and other incidents. Uh, Jewish students basically attacked on campus, you know, whether or not they were expressing their support uh, for the state of Israel. Um, it, it, meanwhile, as, as the Jewish philanthropists are putting their, their names on, on the buildings of the science and arts, you had uh, Qatari and Saudi money coming into these universities, uh, specifically earmarked to fund Middle East studies programs. Uh, the Qataris were selecting the deans of these programs and the professors, and these programs were advancing an anti-Israel narrative on the college campus. Uh, and now the graduates of these Middle East studies programs and courses are not only uh, teaching university campuses, they're also teaching uh, grade schools, high schools and the like, and, and many of these graduates are now running around the halls of the Congress. And so it's no wonder that uh, as you look at age demographics across the United States, the younger and younger you get, uh, the less uh, sensitive you are to be supporting the state of Israel and its cause. So it's good that now these donors are, are waking up and realizing that the situation has gone too far and, and they're threatening to take some funding, which has led to uh, Liz McGill uh, putting in her resignation this week after that her horrific testimony that she gave. Let's see if this actually leads to a meaningful change on the campus uh, and a safe space for students that are Jewish. All right. Well, Alex, uh, thank you for your Jerusalem Minute. And, you know, this leads to a lot of questions because... As you said, anti-Semitism has not been a new phenomenon, but how did it get so bad so fast? Well, when you don't tackle it in its infancy, it just continues to metastasize. And that's what we've seen happen on the college campuses. Uh, and you could only imagine uh, if there would be this kind of intimidation and harassment of other groups, whether that would be uh, black or Hispanic based on gender, based on sexual preference, universities would clamp down on this very, very quickly. You know, people say that uh, you're allowed to say uh, from the river to the sea, you know, which is essentially a call for genocide or intifada intifada, which is a call for violence, uh, particularly uh, against Jews and, and other non-Muslims. Uh, you know, you, you, 
if this was happening against any other group, this would be clamped down on. But the university campuses are not bastions of free speech. They're bastions of selected speech against uh, for and against selected groups. You know, and we really see, uh, you know, this hearing that we saw in Congress. I mean, it was a five hour long hearing and we took just, you know, one clip. But we really see that these presidents had no plan to combat anti-Semitism. You know, in another uh, clip, we saw another congressman asking the presidents what actions they've taken to combat anti-Semitism. And there was silence across the board. Well, they're not uh, they're not condemning hate speech. Uh, the University of Pennsylvania, Liz McGill, for example, refused to come out against a, a Palestine Solidarity Book Week uh, two months ago, which was an anti-Israel hate fest. Um, so they're not doing what they should have been doing to protect the Jewish students. And, and it took an event like October 7th uh, to finally bring uh, this anti-Semitism uh, to the forefront. Uh, and really, it's at this point, it, it's the donors and it's also the governments that have to have plans uh, or have to force the universities to have plans. Yes, you can say what you want on a college campus, uh, but if you're fostering anti-Semitism, that doesn't mean that you need to receive federal or state funding. So let's see if the Congress actually forces the hands of the universities to make meaningful changes. And the donors, I mean, as you mentioned, many are pulling their funding, but does it even matter when they have billions coming in from states like Qatar? Well, it does matter uh, because the university president's uh, primary responsibility is to raise funds. And if the donors keep coming out uh, and saying, we're not going to give to the school, you know, the boards are going to turn around to the presidents and say, how come you're not able to raise money? Uh, and if many of these donors are Jewish and we're talking about billions of dollars, it's significant amounts of money here. But I mean, if they're getting that money instead from Qatar, well, they're getting some of the money from Qatar, and it could also be up to uh, it could be up to the Congress to legislate against allowing foreign funding coming into American universities. So I think that there are steps that can be taken. They should have been taken decades ago. Uh, it's going to take a, a, a forceful hand to, to make those changes. And so, you know, that's my my next question is, you know, this clearly was a wake up call. Do you think things will get better? Do you think they'll stay the same? Do you think they'll get worse? I don't have high hopes uh, for the university campuses. I, I think that not only are the university campuses uh, anti-Israel, anti-Jewish, uh, to a large extent, I think some of these university campuses are preaching uh, anti-American ideology. Uh, and it's you're seeing that the, the system is broken. They're, it's not safe for Jewish students to go to schools. It's not safe for Americans that believe in a strong America uh, to go to campuses. They're being indoctrinated uh, with critical race theory. Uh, with this DEI phenomenon that's come out, and it really, and the, the whole concept of intersectionality. And somehow or another, Israel's gotten placed on the outside of intersectionality, even though it probably should be the very model uh, for intersectionality. Absolutely. All right, Alex. Well, that's all the time we have today. Thank you for tuning in. That's been a Jerusalem Minute. And be sure to join us again next time as we address the week's major top stories out of Israel.